Please be seated. Ms. Ellen, what state's next witness, please? Uh, thank you. The state will call uh, Sergeant Coleman. To thank stand. you. Deputy, if you'll come up, please. And raise your right hand for administration of the oath. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Ms. Ellenwood. Can you state your name for the record and spell your last? Sergeant Charles Coleman, last name C O L E M A N. Sergeant, where are you employed? I am a patrol sergeant with the St. Croix County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and how long have you been employed there? I've been with St. Croix County since 2010. And your current rank is as a sergeant? Correct. And what do you do as a sergeant? I uh, oversee and supervise uh, the general patrol duties of uh, deputies that are working in the county. Now, Deputy Col Sergeant Coleman, excuse me, um, in your training and experience, have you had uh, specific training in certain types of uh, areas of crime? I do. And what would those be? I'm a traffic uh, crash reconstructionist through Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, can you briefly tell the jury what is a traffic crash reconstructionist? Any fatal crash that happens in our county or some of the surrounding counties, uh, I go out there with uh, forensic equipment. We forensically map the uh, crash scene. I end up taking that evidence back to the sheriff's office. I end up looking through the data and use uh, trigonometry, calculus, and other algebra, uh, algebra formulas to determine speeds of vehicles before they start skidding and at impact during crashes. Do you have to have specific training in order to essentially have that title? Correct. Um, what other training have you gone to, um, officer, particularly regarding homicides, if any? I went to the 2016 and 2018 vehicular homicide conference that the State Department of Justice uh, uh, has. It's a three-day, 24-hour conference for, for each year, and we do updates on vehicular homicide cases. Um, at that training, or in your past training, um, have you had training on how to deal with crime scenes? Yes. And uh, what has that training uh, led you to believe or do in your practice as a sergeant? <clears throat> Not to uh, jump to conclusions, to analyze uh, a scene before I make determinations on what, what occurred. What has your training taught you with regards to um, just the crime scene in general itself? Uh, to make sure, one, to secure the scene. Uh, evidence is not permanent. Uh, evidence can sometimes disappear within uh, minutes or hours where we have skid marks and, and other uh, items. Um, and sometimes evidence can remain permanently, such as gouge marks and uh, scrapes along the roadways. In your training experience, have you been taught how to deal uh, with uh, perhaps distraught family members that may be on scene? Some experience, or some training, yes. Okay. And what has that training taught you, if anything? Uh, to try to empathize with the family and speak with them, um, and, and not to try to sympathize and, and emotionalize myself into it. Through your training, have you uh, learned about what you should do with family members at a crime scene? Yes. And what is that? Uh, to separate them from the actual scene. Why is that? Uh, to secure the, the scene and secure the evidence that might be associated with that scene. Um, is there a safety reason at all that you would do that, officer? Um, well, for one, if, if the crime scene includes any type of dangerous weapon, um, when someone's in an emotional state, I wouldn't want that person uh, around that or having access to that. Uh, Sergeant, in your training and experience, is a dangerous weapon a firearm? Yes. Could be a firearm? Yes. Now, speaking of firearms, um, what training have you had with regards to firearms? Um, I'm on our county's uh, SWAT team. We're called the ERU, Emergency Response Unit Team. So I have the 40 hours of uh, basic SWAT training that was uh, involved there. Uh, I was also in tactical medic uh, training uh, that's involved with situations involving gunshot wounds or wounds related to SWAT call incidences. Um, have you also had training as a ballistic shield instructor? Yes. And what is that? So the, the shield um, 
operator on a SWAT team is the first person that holds up a ballistic shield, much like uh, in your Roman uh, movies, that uh, collect, uh, excuse me, protect the people that are behind it or the operators that are behind it. I was trained to not only operate the, the shield, but also instruct others on how to handle the shield. Um, do you do any other instruction um, in your line of work? I am one of our county's uh, field training officers, so in FTO, any of our new hires uh, that the, the sheriff hires, um, I assist in, in our FTO program. Now, uh, Sergeant Coleman, I want to direct your attention to the early morning hours of April 14th of 2018. Were you working on that day? I was. And do you recall what time uh, that you clocked on that day? I believe 9 p.m. Um, would that have been April 13th of 2018? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, what were your hours going to be that day? Normal patrol hours would be from 9 p.m. until 6.30 a.m. the next morning. Um, were you working that shift with Deputy Chase Duran? I was. Um, sometime around... Just one moment. Sometime around 4.13 uh, in the a.m., uh, were you dispatched out to a call? I was. And what type of call was that, if you remember? A male with a uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Uh, and uh, any other information was provided besides a self-inflicted gunshot wound? That the dispatch told me that the, the caller was... It was chaotic. It was uncooperative. They could hear yelling in the background and eventually CPR. Uh, was started with one of the callers. Um, and were you given the address of uh, this location where this had occurred? I was. And what was that address, if you remember? 1489, 142nd Street in Richmond Township. Is that here in St. Croix County, Wisconsin? It is. Okay. And um, did you then go to that scene? I did. At what time did you arrive, if you recall? Uh, between 426 and arriving inside the residence at 428 a.m. Um, so it took you, what, maybe 10 minutes to get to the location? Around 15. 15 minutes. Why did it take you so long? I was on County Road I um, near Bass Lake Road. If anyone knows that area, there's no direct roadway um, to Highway 65 and County Road G in the general area of, of the incident. They had to take a bunch of back roads, and unfortunately it was uh, snowing and, and icy that night. Did you call for additional help um, to respond to that call? I did. And why did you do that? Uh, I asked for help from New Richmond PD because they were generally close to the crime or to the call scene. Did anyone from New Richmond indicate if they would respond to that scene? Sergeant Jake Sather indicated he would be responding. Um, and so you got there at what time? Approximately 4:26 a.m. And uh, when you got there, what did you do? I informed dispatch via radio that I, that I was on scene. Um, I was technically about a block away. I was trained that way, so that way I had only one issue to deal with, and that is arriving on scene and, and uh, viewing the general layout. When I arrived on scene, I saw a Jeep vehicle with registration, and I informed dispatch of that registration. Okay, and how did you do that? Uh, over the radio, I informed them of a vehicle they called it 1028, the registration, and then I gave them the, the plate number. If you say something um, like 118 King Boy Boy, would that sound familiar to maybe what you told dispatch that night? Yes. Or that morning, excuse me? Correct. Um, and after you um, relate to dispatch this uh, license plate, what did you then do? Uh, I arrived... Um, parked in the driveway and walked into the main entry door. Okay. Um, who did you come into the home with, if you recall? There was no one that came with me from the outside inside, no, no one. Okay. Um, who was there when you got on scene? Sergeant Sather was upstairs. There were two uh, medical EMS uh, professionals from New Richmond EMS, um, Kale Fleischauer, Summer Johnson Fleischauer, and Chase Fleischauer. 
Uh, now, you've identified um, the Fleshauer family. Had you previously known who they were? No. Um, through the course of your investigation, were you able to determine uh, who was who? Yes. Okay. So, uh, when you got to uh, the home, what did you do first? So, I'm walking up, uh, just viewing uh, what the conditions outside were like. I looked through the storm door, which was a large glass door. The interior um, door was open, but it was fogged up or clouded up, so I couldn't really see through. Open the door and uh, viewed where everyone was at. And you had previously described that it sounds like everybody was on the upper level? Everyone was on the upper level, yes. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Sergeant. How would you describe the home? So the, uh, the home is a, a two-story uh, split-level house. The main entry um, door is on the west side of the building. The roadway, 142nd Street, is a north-south roadway. As you walk in from the driveway, on the west side of the building is the main entry door. As you open up the door, like any split level, one level goes downstairs, one up level goes up. The downstairs uh, was to the left, and the upstairs was to the right. <coughs> Uh, did you uh, then go up the stairs? I went up the stairs. And what did you see? Observed uh, op open concept living room and kitchen area uh, with an island. I observed uh, a couple couches on the right hand side in the living room area. There was a uh, female kneeled down in the living room area and there was a male crouched behind her. <coughs> May I have permission to uh, show Exhibit 13? Yes. <coughs> um, Sergeant, can you see Exhibit 13 here? I can. Okay. And um, is this the living room that you had previously described? It is. Now, you said that you saw um, two people. Let me back up. Um, where did you see people um, in the home as you're standing at the top of the stairs? So I'm standing at the top of the stairs in the living room area as a female kneeled down on the edge of that red carpet. Behind her is another male knelt behind her. There's a male laying down on the floor um, just to the left of the photograph by the kitchen island. There's a male wearing pants, socks, and no t-shirt. He had uh, a large amount of blood pooled around the head area. I also saw two medics and Sergeant Sather standing over the uh, top of the deceased person. May I show Exhibit 11, Judge? Yes. <coughs> Sergeant, does this um, show roughly the area that you had previously described about the male lying on the floor with the pants and the uh, socks on? It does. Now, where would, um, just so the jury is aware, where, where would the um, male you indicated and female be standing in this photo? In this photograph, they would be to the left of the uh, body. Um, would you say directly across from the body, perhaps? From the feet area, directly west, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, You're at the top of the stairs, um, I'm guessing walking into the kitchen. What do you do next? I see the female in the, in the living room area screaming and lunging towards the EMS and, and Sergeant Sather. And so I went directly to them to try to control the scene and, and tell them, let them work, let them work. So what did you do? I created a barrier by placing myself in between uh, Summer and Kale, who were knelt in the in the living room area, and the um, body and the EMS personnel. Why did you do that? Because Summer was uh, yelling, screaming frantically, and lunging towards um, the the scene. Why do you keep calling it the scene, Sergeant? Object to that, Your Honor. Some material sustained as to the form of the question. At this point, is your training experience uh, coming into play as how you're processing this area? No matter what type of call, 
I want to purchase. This is not responsive. Well, I haven't heard the answer yet, so respond to the question, Sergeant. I want to protect any scene that I go to. Um, and by standing between uh, Summer and who we now know as Chase on the floor, were you protecting the scene? Trying to, yes. Um, so what do you do with, um, what observations do you make about um, Summer and the male standing next to her? Summer is, is kneeled down. She has a... Uh, moderate amount of blood on each hand and on her clothing. She's lunging towards um, Chase and the medics. And behind her is uh, Kale, who is uh, restraining her from lunging and uh, emotionless, not saying anything. Um, now you've identified him as Kale. Um, who did you previously learn him to uh, be? Or his name? Kale Fleischauer. Okay, and is he present here today in the courtroom? What's the ladies? Thank you. Identification stipulated. Um, you just described Kale as emotionless. The only thing I saw him doing objectively was restraining uh, Summer. Um, what do you do next, um, <coughs> Sergeant? I told uh, Summer to let them work, let them work, and then um, as Deputy Proshek entered the the residence, we started physically picking her up and removing her from the living room area. Uh, where do you take her, if anywhere? Uh, she was escorted, me holding on to one of her arms and Deputy Proshek holding on to her right, and we were escorting her down the, the stairs into the entryway and eventually into the basement area. What did you do next? I asked for Kale to also leave the, the living room area. And did he? He did. And how did, uh, what observations, if any, did you make about him walking uh, from the living room area? He had difficulty walking down the stairs with his balance. He had a very strong odor of uh, alcohol coming from his person. And when I later talked to him, I observed other features. Uh, we'll get to that, Sergeant. Um, did he then join um, officers or anyone on that uh, landing area? He remained in the, the landing area, the entry area of the house until he was uh, removed from the residence. And that's by the front door? Yes. What did you do next? I went back to speak with um, EMS staff and we were gonna either confirm with their non-working on Chase, whether they were gonna confirm his death through calling into a doctor or if we were gonna get a medical examiner involved. So then what happened, if you know? Uh, it took probably about a minute, minute and a half, speaking with EMS on, on what to do and, and how, to, how we were going to go forward with uh, pronouncing uh, Chase deceased. And from there, I recall Chase coming upstairs and, or excuse me, Deputy Duran coming upstairs and doing photographs. Um, then what did you do? I started visually looking through the scene, and I had a minute, minute and a half conversation with Sergeant Sather. It was the first time we were able to kind of meet together a little bit and talk, um, and so we, we had a brief conversation. And what was that conversation about? About uh, where the location of the gun was at the time and um, evidence that he saw. I was looking for evidence really to the spent shell and um, where the gun was at this time. Um, so when you're having this conversation, what part of the, um, the home are you in, if you remember? The upper level. Um, and you have a conversation about um, a handgun? Yes. Uh, what was that conversation about? Jake was, as I'm just reviewing the crime scene and looking over, saying that he found it in the hallway. He said he initially couldn't find it, and then he said when he did find it, he found it in the hallway, he picked it up with two fingers and put it on top of the, the refrigerator. Um, are you um, at this point looking at the gun or just talking about the gun? What are you doing with the gun, if anything? Nothing with the gun. I hadn't looked at it or um, examined it yet. Um, <coughs> after Sergeant Sather told you that he found the firearm in the hallway, what happened next? Uh, he spoke briefly with Chase about splatter marks, 
I had asked him a couple times, was the used, uh, used round, where's the used round? And he said he, he hadn't found it yet. And he ended up walking downstairs because uh, Summer was screaming with Deputy Proshek. <coughs> Why did you ask uh, Deputy Duran where the spent round was, or used round, I'm sorry? I, uh, I was asking Sergeant Sather where the used round was be, to kind of determine which way it possibly ejected from a gun. And at that point, um, were you aware if um, a used round was found at all? No. So what did you do next? At some point, I had wanted to, I, while examining the scene, I was on my tippy toes looking for the gun since it was on the fridge. Um, now, Sergeant Coleman, um, can I ask how tall are you? Five seven. Um, and if you're on your tiptoes, um, were you able to see um, the gun that Sergeant Sather had placed on top of there? On the fridge, no. Um, and so, did you ask Sergeant Sather to remove the gun for you? He was standing in the entryway as he was moving up and down from the scene that was still chaotic and screaming, and said, "Do you, do you got that?" He was looking at me as I'm on my tippy toes, and he couldn't. So uh, Sergeant Sather walked up and helped me remove the gun. Um, when Sergeant Sather removed the gun, um, did you have a chance to review the area in front of the refrigerator? Yes. Um, did you notice anything um, of importance to you, like blood? No. Um, was there a stool in front of the refrigerator? No. Um, and so, uh, what happened when uh, Sergeant Sather uh, took the gun down? He removed the gun from the top of the fridge in the same manner that he placed it up there with two fingers. He ended up uh, placing it on the island area, and uh, we had pictures taken of it. Okay. And uh, who took those? Who took those photos? Deputy, you know? D Deputy Duran. Okay. Judge, at this time, if I can ask if Investigator Mikla can accompany me to the stand with the sergeant yes. with the firearm? Yes. <clears throat> what did? Uh, what type of gun was it that you? Uh, received from Sergeant Sather off the top of the refrigerator? It was a black 9mm uh, Taurus, I believe. Is that a semi-automatic uh, handgun? Yes. Uh, if you saw it here today, do you think you would uh, recognize it? Yes. <clears throat> well, Investigator Mikla is getting that out. Um, Sergeant Coleman, what did you start doing with the firearm? We took photographs of, of the one face first, and then um, I ended up making the gun safe. Uh, I'll have him approach with the uh, firearm. I believe it's Exhibit 22. Sergeant, what, uh, what is Investigator Mikla uh, showing you on that firearm right now? He's showing that the um, port safe, there's no ammunition inside of that, as well as the magazine well. Um, and does that, again, appear to be the uh, firearm that you saw on April 14th of 2018? Yes. Thank you, Investigator. May I approach? Yes. Sergeant, I'm showing you what's been uh, marked as Exhibit 38. And Judge, I'm only asking that this would be used for demonstrative purposes only. Yes. So Sergeant Coleman, silly question, what is that? It's a replica firearm of a semi-automatic handgun. Um, does it look somewhat similar to Exhibit 22, the uh, Taurus handgun? Yes. Okay. Um, now, at some point, you said that you had to uh, make the firearm safe. Yes. What does that mean? 
approximately 30 seconds before the gun was taken down from the fridge. Um, there was an argument downstairs. I could hear yelling and it was directed from Summer towards Kale. I wanted to make the scene safe. And so I felt that removing any ammunition from the gun was my top priority. Um, how did you know that there was even ammunition in the gun? I didn't. Um, how does one determine if there is ammunition in the gun? Um, you remove first the magazine from the magazine well by touching the, the re magazine release button there. It removes any extra ammunition that would be in the magazine. Secondly, if the gun was used and was fired, if there was another magazine in the well, it would load the second uh, bullet into the barrel. And so you need to manually pull back the slide, lock it, and visually inspect to either watch uh, a bullet be ejected or that there's a bullet still in the, in the barrel area of the gun. Um, did you do that in this situation? I did. Okay. And um, when you ejected the magazine, um, what, if anything, did you note was in the magazine? There were uh, multiple rounds still inside of the magazine. Judge, permission to uh, publish 47? No Granted. Before you had uh, dismantled the firearm, um, did you see the firearm in this condition or close up? I did not zoom in on that area of the gun, no. Okay. Um, are you familiar with firearms? Not with this Taurus model. You're not? No. Okay. After you cleared the gun, um, did you position it in a certain way? I laid it back down on the island. I placed the magazine that and did not remove any of the extra ammunition from the magazine. And I placed the, the live round that was still in the barrel next to the gun. Sergeant, when you say barrel, could I say chamber and mean the same thing? Yes. Okay. Um, and can you show the jury where the chamber or the barrel is on that um, demonstrative exhibit 38? So the slide is the outer cover here. The barrel is where the uh, bullet ends up getting injected in to be fired, and the barrel is usually about three and a half inches long. May I approach, Judge? Yes. Bless you. What are those? There are two photographs uh, by the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory. And uh, what do they appear to show? They show the uh, Taurus 9mm and with the magazine to the right of it and the uh, live round above it. And uh, is that how you place the firearm after you had dismantled it? I placed the firearm in Exhibit 50. Okay. Um, and laying in that direction? Correct. Okay. Um, does that appear to be a true and accurate uh, depiction of how you placed the firearm and as you saw it on April 14th of 2018? It does. Uh, permission to enter and publish? Oh, yes. Received. Publication granted. <coughs> so in Exhibit 50, Sergeant, if um, you can just explain uh, what objects we're seeing in that photo and where they're laying. You see the Taurus 9 millimeter in the middle of the photograph. On the right hand side is the magazine with uh, at least one live round showing at the top. Above the uh, weapon is the live round that was located inside of the chamber or the end of the barrel that I removed physically myself. Um, now in exhibit 51, um, have you had a chance to look at that photo? I have. And uh, what does this appear to be a depiction of, if you know? So it ends up taking uh, the same firearm, and instead of laying it on its <coughs> right face, ends up flipping it over to show the condition of the face that was originally facing on the island. And you had a chance to uh, visually inspect this firearm, correct? Yes. Um, on April 14th of 2018? Yes. Appear to be a true and accurate depiction of that firearm as you saw it on that day? Yes. Permission to publish and enter? 
objection. Granted. Publication granted. <coughs> Again, Sergeant, can you just tell the jury what we're seeing in this photo? Again, in the middle of the photograph is the uh, Taurus uh, handgun. This, uh, this time the barrel is facing towards the right instead of the left. The magazine's in the same spot as well as the live, live round above it. After you had uh, dismantled the firearm, uh, what did you do next? Started looking over the scene. I started contemplating in my head what was going on and trying to process the scene in general. Uh, so what did that cause you to do, Sergeant? Uh, scan around the rooms, look around, um, recall what I had seen in the I think, six minutes that I was there, um, and try to figure out what type of uh, call we had. Why are you questioning what type of call you have if you, told, <coughs> if you were told it's a self-inflicted gunshot wound? Object to that, Your Honor. It's a conclusion of the witness and her own. Sustained. Uh, did you start to uh, question why you were um, dispatched out to that location? Yes. So what did you then do? I was listening to Sergeant Sather question, Kale, from upstairs down. I was reviewing where the gun was originally located by Sergeant Sather and reviewing that the firearm where uh, that we examined it afterwards. Through your training and experience, Sergeant, um, are you taught where to look for firearms and self-inflicted gunshot wounds? Yes. And where are you taught to look for those firearms? Firearm is usually still in the hands of the, the victim or uh, around the body. Um, in this case, were, did you learn that the firearm was uh, someplace besides by the body or in the victim's hand? Yes. With that information, what did you then start to do? I listened to the question that Sergeant Sather asked Kale. He said... And what was that question? He said, where were you at the time of, that this happened? And when Sergeant Sather asked Kale that question, where was Kale standing? He was in the entryway still with his back facing towards the garage entry door facing to the south. May I approach judge on exhibit 37? Yes. appear to be a transcript of Sergeant Sather's recording? Yes. And does it appear to be roughly uh, 47 pages, if you can see? Yes. Okay. I want to direct your attention to page 20 of that transcript. Yes, ma'am. Um, about the middle of the page, um, or at the top of the page, let me back up. on page 19, um, do you see a line where it says by Sergeant Sather, sir, where, where was, were you up here when it happened? Do you, I do. Did I read that correctly? You did. Okay. And um, does it appear on page 20 <coughs> that the defendant responds, I was up in the kitchen? Yes. Now, is this the conversation that you were previously talking about when Sergeant Sather started to talk to Kale at the bottom of the stairs? It was. Okay. Now, um, from your memory, not from the transcript, after the, did you hear the defendant say, I was up in the kitchen? I did. And what happened next? Sergeant Sather then replied, well, was he standing? Since he was, he answered the question the way he did. And how did the defendant respond, if you, if you know? A lot of mumbling, 
um, and I didn't recall exactly what he said. Did you ask a follow-up question in response to um, Sergeant Sather's question, uh, was he standing? I did. And what was that question? So you were up here when this happened. And how did the defendant respond? He said, no, I was, uh, and then gave me a nonverbal. And what was that nonverbal? Shrugged with uh, shoulder, head area, and said I was there. Um, so it looks like, so just so the record is clear, uh, you are moving your head and upper body in a, I don't know, sideways motion? Or is it a diagonal motion? I would describe it as diagonal. Um, were, were you able to see the defendant do that motion? I was. And um, from that motion, uh, what information did you gather from that? From the position that he was standing in, I believe that he, his nonverbal was pointing directly towards the southeast. And uh, what of significance was in the southeast location of that home? That was the location of Chase. So how did you respond to that? I said, well, that, that's where he's at right now. How did the defendant respond to that? I think he said, um, and then didn't say much else. If you had a chance to look over uh, Exhibit 37 of a transcript of that conversation, would that refresh your memory of how the defendant responded when you said, that's where he's at right now? It would. Okay. Can I just have you silently and quickly look at page 20, um, middle of the paragraph on Exhibit 37? Sergeant, does that refresh your memory as to what the defendant said? Yes. And what did he say? He said, no, no, I was in, and then I, it was inaudible. And uh, after he said, no, no, I was, what did you say? If you looked at exhibit 37, would that refresh your memory? Yes. Hey, and where, well, that's where he's right now. And that was your responding to his nonverbal gesture? Yes. And how did Kale respond to that when you said that's where he's at right now? That's where he said, um, and didn't say much else. Do you have um, Exhibit 37 in front of you, Sergeant? I do. On page 20? Do you see where you say, hey, and where that's where he's at right now? Does Kale respond, yeah, I understand? He says, yeah, I understand, I don't know. After he says that uh, to you, what do you then do? I then spent the next 30 seconds in my mind digesting the scene before calling the, my captain. Okay. And uh, who is your captain? Uh, Captain Jeffrey Clapp. And you had a conversation with him? I did. Why'd you call him? Jeff, that was irrelevant. No. Sustained. Um, by calling Captain Clapp, were you given further instructions on what you were supposed to do as a law enforcement officer? I was. And is that why you called him? <coughs> yes. And what were those instructions for you to do, then do? To contact Investigator Sean Demulin and Investigator uh, Jim Mikla. Um, and did you then do that? I did. Um, after you contacted them, what happened next? I, contact, I had dispatch contact a chaplain to respond to the scene to assist, since it was a chaotic scene. I then walked downstairs to start speaking with Kale. When you went downstairs, is that the um, entryway where the defendant was? In the entryway, yes. Um, how did that conversation go? I walked down and stated that we were having a cha chaplain respond to the scene. I then asked them if they needed EMS, since they also had a blood on them. 
and then continued uh, speaking with him. Okay. Um, did the defendant indicate to you at any time if he had any injuries on his body? I don't recall him saying no. Um, so you had a conversation um, with the defendant in the entry room? I did. Who else is down there while you're down there with the defendant? Deputy Chase Durand and Sergeant Sather was walking <laughs> up and down from the lower level, back and forth, monitoring our conversation as well as going down and speaking with Deputy Proshek with Summer. Um, at this point, um, do you or Deputy Duran start to take pictures of the defendant? Yes. And uh, who takes those photos? Deputy Duran. Um, while Deputy Duran is taking those photos, what happens? I asked him what happened tonight. He said he didn't remember. So I asked basic questions. His last name, or his first name, his middle name, and his last name. Did he provide you answers to those questions? Is, uh, he, he provided answers to his name and his middle name was spelling. And then he stopped and interjected when I asked him his last name. And what did he interject, if you remember? He stated, I'm going to tell you how it is. I didn't, I didn't kill my chase. Did you continue to ask him questions? I did. And what were those questions, if you recall? So how is it? So what happened tonight? He said he didn't remember. I asked him to rewind back. Do you remember, did you work yesterday? Why did you ask that question? Check that that was irrelevant, Your Honor. Sustained. Uh, through your training and experience, are you taught to uh, use certain interviewing techniques when talking with witnesses or suspects? Yes. And um, through that training and experience, does that help you um, orientate a person as to um, their time and place as they are standing there that day. It does. Um, did you use that technique or try to use that technique when speaking with the defendant? I tried. Okay. And subsequently you asked that question about, well, what were you doing on Friday night? I asked him if he was working yesterday. And was he able to respond to you? He said he wasn't working yesterday. Um, did you continue then the conversation? I asked him, so what were you doing last night? How did he respond, if you know? said I wasn't working yesterday. At this point, what are you observing about the defendant himself? He has a strong order of intoxicants coming from his person. He's using the, the back of the door to balance himself. Um, and when he is standing up straight, he's wavering back and forth, and he had very red and glossy eyes. As you're having this conversation with him, um, does Deputy Duran continue to take photos of him? He does. And how does the defendant respond to that, excuse me, if you know? Uh, he, he gave some nonverbals as well as saying no, that he didn't like it. What were those nonverbals? Uh, moaning and just kind of just not looking, just didn't seem cooperative. At some point, did the defendant seem to get agitated? He did. Uh, tell me about that. Um, I believe it was when Chase, or uh, excuse me, Deputy Durand is in front of him taking photographs, and he's like, what's up, sunshine? He then uh, exposed his genitals to Deputy Durand. Uh, does he say anything? He said he wants some cock. Uh, how many times does he say that, if you know? Three. Um, how are you responding to that? Initially, we were didn't say anything to him, Deputy Objection. Durant. This is not a response if he was asked how he responded, Your Honor. Sustained. You can just answer the question, Sergeant. Sorry, Your Honor. Did I did not respond? say anything. Um, after, um, <coughs> after he asked you if you want some cock, what did you do? He raised up his arms and started walking towards Deputy Durand. At that point, I blanketed his left arm. Um, Judge, I would ask for permission for the uh, sergeant to stand up and demonstrate to the jury what that looked like. Thank you. You can do so. After the third request, he opened his hands up like this and started walking slowly towards Deputy Durand. It appears, uh, Sergeant, if I described that correctly, you raised your arms about mid-shoulder. Would you agree with that? Between the hips and the shoulders, yes. Okay. Um, from that gesture, then, 
What did you then do? I blanketed his left arm and Deputy Proshek blanketed his right and um, we placed handcuffs on him. Why? Because of his aggressive behavior of uh, walking towards Deputy Durand, uh, we needed to detain him. Was the decision eventually made that um, you needed to get uh, individuals out of the home? Yes. And were those individuals Summer and the defendant? They were. And uh, why did you make that decision? Same object, Your Honor. <laughs> Sustained. You previously testified um, through your training experience that you have uh, training in scene protection. Yes, ma'am. Uh, removing individuals from a scene, is that part of scene protection? Yes. Um, did that play a uh, role in your decision to remove the defendant and Summer from the home? It did. Uh, so what was the plan then about removing them from the home? After I concluded my conversation with Captain Clatt, I made the determination that we were going to secure the residence. So what did you decide to do? Remove each person from the house. Um, where did the defendant go, if you know? Into Deputy Proshek's squad. Uh, Sergeant, earlier we heard a transcript um, that someone um, named Peaches uh, was involved um, in this case. Who is Peaches? Deputy Proshek. Is that just a nickname for Deputy Proshek? It is. Okay. Um, and where did Summer go, if you know? I requested New Richmond EMS to return to the scene and she was triaged inside of the um, ambulance. Now, um, after um, Summer and the defendant were removed from the home, what did you do next? I spoke briefly with uh, Investigator Demuline and Investigator Mikla and did a final walkthrough with Sergeant Sather. Um, and what did you discuss, if anything, with Sergeant Sather? We discussed what, uh, what evidence he viewed at the scene and how he finally, how he came upon the scene. This was the first time we had a formal walk through and talk through the actual scene together. Sergeant, I apologize, I should have asked you, you said that you talked with the detectives on the, um, that you spoke with them. Was that in person or on the phone? On the phone. Okay. At this point, once um, the defendant and some are outside of the home, who's now left inside of the home? Deputy Proshek remained with Kale. Deputy Durand had to remain with Summer in the ambulance, and the only people left inside were Sergeant Sather and myself. Um, and um, I'm guessing Chase was still in the home? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so did you start to have a conversation then with Sergeant Sather about uh, where the firearm was located? I did. And how did that conversation go? I asked him to tell me where the, the firearm was located, um, he brought me to the area in the, the hallway, and I physically drew a crude gun on a 3 by 5 notebook, uh, uh, notebook sheet of paper. May I approach? Yes. Sergeant, I'm showing you it's been um, already offered and received as Exhibit 23. Screen Thank you. Uh, what is that? It's my crude drawing of the semi-automatic handgun. Um, was that a piece of paper that you had uh, given to Sergeant Sather? After I drew uh, the gun, yes. Uh, may I publish? Yeah. Is this the uh, drawing of the gun that you did on April 14th of 2018? It is. Thank you. What did you then do, or Sergeant Sather do, with this piece of paper? He placed it on the ground in the hallway. And where in the hallway, if you recall? Approximately 12 to 15 feet south of the uh, body of Chase. Uh, 
permission to show Exhibit 24, please? Yes. Sergeant, um, before we talk about Exhibit 24, you just said um, this piece of paper was placed, in your estimation, 12 to 15 feet from Chase? Objected as it's repetitious. He's leaving. He's testifying to it. I, I apologize, Judge. I didn't hear him, so I just want to make sure. That was his testimony. Let's move on. Okay. Um, what are we seeing here in Exhibit 24? This is the hallway directly south of uh, the kitchen and living room area, or excuse me, directly north of the kitchen and living room area. And that uh, white piece of paper is Exhibit 23, if you know? It is. Okay. Now, how did Sergeant Sather place this on the ground? He bent over and set it on the ground. Did he orientate it a certain way? Check that this is leading. Caution, Ms. Ellenwood, but let's answer it. He positioned it the way he saw it. Showing you our permission to show Exhibit 25, Judge? Yes. Can I, can I approach Judge with Exhibit 25? Yes. <coughs> Does this appear to be a, a close-up um, of Exhibit 24? It appears to be a close-up of Exhibit 25. So maybe better asked, Sergeant, what's been displayed as a close-up of what you're looking at, correct? It is, yes. Thank you. May I approach again? Yes. I'm showing you Exhibit 24. Yes, ma'am. Uh, after seeing 24, does 25 appear to be a close-up of Exhibit 24? Yes. Are you able to see at which way that drawing is orientated on the floor? The handle is facing... No. Do the photos indicate which way the gun is oriented? Oh, yes, barely, but yes. Okay. Um, and do you recall as to how the gun was orientated on the floor placed by Sergeant Sather? Yes. And how was that? The handle facing towards the south and the barrel facing towards the, the uh, west. Um, I had drawn the photograph. Check that this is repetitious, not responsive. Oh, well, overruled as to that objection <coughs> question, Ms. Ellenwood. Um, were you finished with your answer, Sergeant? I was not. Well, you asked him which way it was oriented. He answered that, and then he wanted to go on, and that's where I'm cutting him off. So question. So you, you indicated that the barrel of the gun was facing west? Correct. And uh, what other position um, of the magazine, which way was that facing? South. Sergeant Coleman, um, eventually did you um, clear uh, the scene and, and leave the area? Yes. Did you subsequently write reports um, about what you had done on uh, April 14th of 2018? I did. Um, did you review um, other officers' reports um, or meet with other officers to um, perhaps get a timeline of uh, when people arrived or when they left? We did. And um, what other documents did you... <coughs> Uh, review um, to help get a timeline for yourself of uh, when things occurred on that morning. I reviewed the dispatch CAD sheet, the audio of Sergeant Sather's body camera and video, squad video, as well as the audio from uh, Deputy Durand to determine a timeline. Judge, may I approach? Yes. <coughs> I'm showing this in marked as Exhibit 52. Uh, have you seen that document before? I have. 
And what is that? This is the uh, timeline of the, uh, the timeline I created the morning of that incident. Okay. And did you take the information that you had previously received or reviewed to create this timeline? I did. Judge, I'm only asking that this would be published and shown to the jury for demonstrative purposes only. I incur any objection, Mr. Yeah. Gray, for that limited purpose? Yes, I do object. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this appears to be a good time to break for the evening because the attorneys and I will take up this issue outside of your presence. So with that said, uh, we're done for the day. You know what's coming next, and that is do not. Do not conduct any experiments. Do not complete any research or investigation. Do not look up any of the parties to find out additional information. Likewise, as best you're able, try to avoid any news coverage, any Facebook coverage, any other social media associated with this matter. Do not visit with family members, friends, or others about uh, what you've heard thus far uh, today. And I think you understand what I'm asking of you. With that said, folks, did arriving by that 8 o'clock work for all of you this morning? So let's do that again tomorrow morning. Again, you can park in the no parking uh, sections. Those are for you. So uh, park there. Come into the south end, the bailiff, and uh, of course security will meet you, bring you up. And that would permit us then to start by about 8.15. Leave your notes with the bailiff. He'll collect them. We'll redistribute them tomorrow morning. Thank you for your time and attention today. We'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Ms. Ellen, would, uh, what's your offer of proof regarding this exhibit? Judge, um, just briefly, um, the reason that the state wants to do it is really just a summary um, of exhibits and having, um, instead of calling other additional officers to say, when did you arrive, when did you leave, things like that. I just believe it's, it's literally just used for a demonstrative purpose, um, just to frankly, Judge, keep, keep the things moving, keep the matters moving. Uh, Mr. Gray, and why do you not want this demonstrative exhibit in? Well, <clears throat> 428. Well, let me ask first, and I apologize. Do you challenge the information that's contained on that exhibit? Yes, and the inflammatory part of the information. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do, counsel. I'll take a look at it tonight. We can deal with the inflammatory part. I guess I'm more concerned, Mr. Gray, as to whether you believe what is included on this demonstrative is in fact supported by other evidence. So exhibits or reports or things that we could glean these uh, particular times from the inflammatory part is a separate issue, but I'm more interested whether it captures what is in evidence or arguably may be in evidence, and then we'll take it up tomorrow morning at 8, see everyone here. I'm tired, I trust you're tired. We'll see you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning when we're all fresh. Thank you. We're adjourned for the day. Judge, you just want me to hand it to Anna? Yes. It's number 52. And, Counsel, I believe we have an agreement. Yeah, Vicki. An agreement stipulation that the firearm...